Truth Espresso, Episode 31. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> And now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. This is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here. Before we get into our topic, I just want to let you know about my free ebook, Jesus, God Among Us. It will strengthen your faith by explaining who Jesus is and what he did for you. Get to know him deeper today than you ever imagined. Snag your copy of my free ebook, Jesus, God Among Us, by going to truthhub.org forward slash Jesus. That's truthhub.org slash Jesus. Hello, everybody. This is Daniel Minnick here, and welcome to Truth Espresso. Now, you might not know that back in 2015, I had an ambition to start a podcast, and I did try to do that at the time, but I really was not aware of what all was involved in podcasting, such as the amount of commitment you need to do, especially in the area of consistent delivery. I also was a little over-ambitious at the time, trying to put together a lot of cool sound effects and something to the effect of fake commercials for entertainment purposes. And so I might air those commercials uh, for nostalgia a little bit later on in the series. But I figured for Truth Espresso episode 31, I would revive one of my recordings from five years ago. So the podcast that I attempted to start back in 2015 was called The Truth Hub Podcast, hosted on my Truth Hub website. And I was going over basic Christian theology and apologetics. And I had this idea that I would make different series that would build off of each other. The first series would be called Foundations to go over the essentials of the Christian faith. And then the next series would be called Walls to describe outsiders basically heresies that Christians should not hold. And then I would create a series called Interior Decorating, which would describe various positions that Christians can hold within the realm of orthodoxy, basically sibling rivalry type of stuff. So this first episode of the Truth Hub podcast that I did five years ago was about the foundation of monotheism, the belief in one God, and how that the doctrine of the Trinity that Christians confess is based on monotheism. So without further ado, enjoy. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, people of all ages, to the very first episode of the Truth Hub podcast. It is my hope and prayer, Lord willing, that this is not also the last episode. <laughs> to take a verse completely out of context, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. <laughs> no, I, I, do, I, uh, I anticipate this being the first episode in a series of related episodes, and I'm going to talk to you briefly about my podcast plans for at least the uh, starting out what this podcast is going to be about. I envision for the Truth Hub podcast initially that I will come out with a series um, or several series of podcasts, the first of which will be called Foundations, The basically the imagery being that of the parts of a house or building a house. Um, the first series would be called Foundations, uh, which is basically the fundamentals of the faith. How do we understand what Christianity really is? Uh, there is a, a lot of imitators out there. There are a lot of people who call themselves Christians, but they have different beliefs from that 
what uh, from those beliefs that are traditionally considered orthodoxy and so i will attempt to lay the foundations from scripture uh what really is christianity in opposition to these uh imitators and these foes the next series after the foundation series will be what i would call walls so the purpose of walls are twofold uh first it is to keep and protect what is inside from being tarnished it is also to keep things that are outside the fold outside the house from getting in and so the purpose of walls will be to protect ourselves from the enemies outside we need to know and we need to identify and we need to understand who our enemies are who are the enemies of christian orthodoxy and also the wolves in sheep's clothing of course there are many people who will say that they are enemies for instance atheists they will out right say i am not a christian and they will uh, obviously argue against christianity but there are also the wolves and sheep's clothing that we need to identify and we need to understand that these are the ones who will say i am a christian and here is why and their explanations for why they are christian are not the same as what we orthodox christians would say and so that is what walls will be about and then the third series will be called Interior Design. Basically, this series will be about what in the fold of what would be considered Christian orthodoxy, what we can have fellowship with each other to some extent. These will be the doctrines that divide us within orthodoxy. Uh, for instance, you have Baptists like Credo Baptist, Pado Baptist, you have Dispensationalist, Covenantal theologists you have um futurists and preterists um different different um standards to discuss but uh we can disagree we can be uh agreeably disagreeable so to say and consider each other brothers and sisters in christ while disagreeing somewhat strongly somewhat in a heated fashion regarding these interior design things but at the same time we should not test orthodoxy by some of these things and so that are is the plan for uh these first series of truth hub podcast foundations then walls and then interior design and so i think it is important that we first discuss the foundations before we start diving into uh whether you should uh what kind of clothes you should wear as a christian what christian morality is we need to understand what christianity is uh, because christianity is not just about morality it is also about um it for instance, I would have to say it is primarily about, well, what does the word Christian mean? It means a follower of Christ. And who is Christ? This is Jesus Christ. This is the one historically known as Jesus of Nazareth. And so what Christianity is centered on, by definition, is who is Jesus Christ? And so uh, looking at our foundations, let me just um, quote read for you a few verses that have that to get our mindset on uh why we need to look at foundations for instance psalm 11 and verses 2 and 3 it says for lo the wicked bend their bow they make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart if the foundations be destroyed what can the righteous do it is important to have the proper foundation. There are many moral people. Yes, Christianity includes morality. You cannot divorce Christianity from its morality. But at the same time, you can have moral uh, Mormons. You can have moral Muslims. You can have moral atheists. And if you just identify your faith merely by the outward or even some of the inward uh, morality that you consider, um, 
You lose the distinctions and many people will lose their morality if their foundations are shaken. If, if someone uh, shakes their faith by uh, giving them arguments about who is Jesus Christ that they've never even looked at carefully, but they can't seem to figure out how to refute, they end up going over to the dark side, as it were, and in the process... They might become atheists, and in that process, they might begin to rethink what is true, what is false regarding morality. And so, it is important to have a good foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 9 through 12, the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church, For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building continuing the building meme according to the grace of god which is given unto me as a wise master builder i have laid the foundation and another builds thereupon but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid which is jesus christ so we see the foundation of christianity is jesus christ and it follows that if the foundation is this individual this person this being of who is jesus christ we need to know who is and what is jesus christ is he just a man? Is he uh, an angel? Is he God himself? Um, who is Jesus Christ? We need to answer that if we can if we are going to call ourselves Christians. Verse 12, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. So you see you can build on that foundation, but you have to have a foundation. What is the importance of a foundation? Even Jesus Christ himself, the one whom we understand Christianity for. It is important to see uh, the words that he told the people as he was here on earth at the time. In Matthew chapter 7 and verses 24 through 27, Jesus Christ gave this parable gave this parable he said therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them i will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock and every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it why it doesn't matter uh, what your house is made of, it doesn't matter uh, how big or how pretty it is. What matters is where it is built. What matters is the foundation. And so, therefore, before you even lay the first brick, before you take the first twig or the first log and attempt to nail it together on another one, you need to first figure out the foundation. And so the foundation of Christianity, it is, as I said before, is the importance of knowing Jesus Christ. As Jesus Christ said in his, in his uh, high priestly prayer in John chapter 17 and verse 3, he said, And this is life eternal, that they, may, that they might know thee, the only true God, he's praying to the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So life eternal includes not only knowing the Father, but knowing Jesus Christ. So we need to know, it sounds like we need to know who and what Jesus Christ is to have life eternal. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, and verse 11, that I may know him, Jesus Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So something about Jesus Christ that he had power in his resurrection, and he was suffer he suffered, and he died, and that Paul and we will be resurrected. It is important to know him, Jesus Christ, and the power of his resurrection. 
Now, just because someone acknowledges that there is an historical Jesus of Nazareth who walked the earth, who lived from about A.D., or sorry, uh, 2 B.C. to around A.D. 33, that doesn't mean that that person is a Christian. There are atheists who, re who uh, believe that there was a Jesus Christ who actually died. There are some atheists, of course, who think Jesus was a myth, but those who believe that there was a historical Jesus, this does not make him a Christian. There are those who believe that, even believing that Jesus was your Messiah, uh, they, you know, that doesn't mean that they are Christians. Yeah, uh, Muslims believe that Jesus was Messiah. Even the Quran says that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of Mary in Surah uh, 4157. And in, there are several other places in the Quran that acknowledge that Jesus Christ was a prophet of God as he himself declared in the word of God, the Bible. That doesn't make Muslims Christians, obviously. And there are other people who are wolves in sheep's clothing who actually call themselves Christians, who will say things about Jesus that they believe he is. But it is important to know who Jesus Christ is. Even the word of God says that there are deceivers and those who will go out and will try to deceive the, the elect and the sheep. And they will be wolves in sheep's clothing. So who is the true Jesus? We need to know. In John chapter 2 and verses 23 through 25 says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. So Jesus, when he was alive, performed miracles, and there were people who believed in him, but we need to understand what it is it what is it that they believed in him in his name about him and was it true or not but in verse 24 but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, there are several times, especially in the Gospel of John, where it says that many people believed on him, but then they turned out to be antagonists, and Jesus even said that they seek to kill him. So, what was it that they believed, and was it was it the full truth and nothing but the truth? And so just because you believe in Jesus, in a Jesus, it does not make you a Christian. You have to believe the, in Jesus for who he is. And continuing on in that same Gospel of John in chapter 8, uh, in verses 30 through 34, it says, As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So they, were, they believed on him, but they were not yet free. So how did they believe on him? They answered him, We are Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth forever. So he's telling him, The Son ever lives. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, of course, he's saying this after the flesh, but ye seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. These are people who, of whom John comments and says that many believed on him, but what did they believe? I would say that these are the same mindset. These were the people looking for an earthly Messiah. And just like uh, after Jesus fed the 5,000, he escaped uh, over the Sea of Galilee, and the people... They, they went in boats, they followed him over to the other side, and, and they were earnestly seeking him because he was the Messiah and he fed them. But then, as he spoke words that they considered hard to understand, they fled away. They left him, even though he did all these miracles. So it doesn't matter. Even if he did miracles, there were people who rejected him. So just so-called believing on him that he's Messiah is not quite enough. 
in Matthew chapter 7 and verses 21 through 23, uh, Jesus talking to his disciples, he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And uh, he also says in John elsewhere that this is the will of him that sent me. He says the will, the will of the Father is to believe on him who sent him. Okay, so verse 22, many will say to me in that day, the last day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So these people who did, even did miracles, you can't judge someone as a Christian by your feelings. You can't judge if someone is a Christian even if they were to do miracles because there are people who can deceive you by working signs and wonders. So the identity of a Christian is not doing good things. The identity of a Christian is to know the Son. And there are false people. But Jesus will reveal who these false people are at the last day. The Apostle Paul says that there is another Jesus, 2 Corinthians 11.4, For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with them. So someone can preach another Jesus, and it's not the right Jesus. So, just because we acknowledge that there was a Jesus that is not true, you have to, it is not Christianity, you have to preach the right Jesus. You have to receive the right spirit, and you have to receive the right gospel. Jesus himself warned his disciples in Mark 13, 22. In the Olivet Discourse, he says, For false Christs and false prophets shall arise, and shall show signs and wonders, like I said before, signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. So there are false Christs and false prophets who proclaim a false Christs. Then the Apostle John, later on, in his epistle of 1 John, this work is definitely an anti-Gnostic work. John knew of the challenges of Gnosticism and that there were Gnostics who would make Jesus Christ one of their uh, people who somehow became divine. They escaped the flesh. They, they became spiritual and, and they preached Jesus Christ and people wanted to be like Jesus Christ in Gnostic thought. But John says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. John, also in the beginning of his letter, he he talks about Gnosticism right from the start, and he is obviously trying to put forth the idea about this this Gnostic idea that the flesh is bad and the the spirit is good. He says, First John one one, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. So, he came from heaven, he was manifested in the flesh, we've seen him with our eyes, we have looked on him, we have even touched him with our hands, but he is also the word of life. Now, something like that would be like scraping your fingernails on a chalkboard and, and shouting in, your ear, in the ear of a Gnostic. It would not be pleasant. Those words are definitely targeted at the Gnostic idea of Jesus, and it is using the truth of who Jesus Christ is. 
The Apostle John also wrote, 2 John 1, 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is deceiver and an antichrist. So if you believe that Jesus was a good spirit, but was not the one come in the flesh, you do not believe in the Jesus of Christianity. You are preaching another Jesus. So it is important as being a Christian, to have a correct Christology, an understanding of who Jesus Christ is. For without an identity of the person of Jesus Christ, you do not have Christianity. And that, my friends, is the foundation. So related to this foundation of who Jesus Christ is... The most fundamental foundation, and this foundation is shared by Judaism and Islam, is that of monotheism. Deuteronomy 4, verse 35, this is even before the giving of the, the famed Ten Commandments, God himself said to the Israelites, Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, or Yahweh, he is God. There is none else beside him. The psalmist said in Psalm 86, verse 10, For thou art great and doest wondrous things, thou art God alone. And then now we get to Deuteronomy 6, and uh, verses 4 through 5, this has become known as uh, the Shema. Uh, Orthodox Jews would, t uh, would say this in, in the Hebrew about twice a day. So it was ingrained into their minds. It says, uh, in the Hebrew, it's Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, or Hear, O Israel, Yahweh, or the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might, because he is the only one God. So saying this twice a day, the Orthodox Jew was uh, confessing monotheism, getting it ingrained into their head. Jesus himself uh, repeated the Shema in Mark 12. Uh, verses 28 through 31, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So the first commandment obviously is not judge not that ye be not judged as uh, many critics of Christianity would would like it to be. The first commandment is monotheism and loving the one God. And then Jesus says, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So the first is know that there is one God. And then the second is knowing that there is one God. How do you treat your neighbor? Deuteronomy 5, verses 6 through 7, I am the Lord Yahweh thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, Yahweh, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Now the statement, my glory will I not give to another, will be key when we identify who is the Christ of Christianity, who is the Christ of the Bible. Isaiah 43, Verses 10 through 11. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there is no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord Yahweh, and beside me there is no Savior. That's, that's interesting. Beside me, God, Yahweh, there is no Savior. That will become very interesting. 
But notice at verse 10, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. I don't know if you have ever count, encountered these people. Uh, usually they would come and knock on your door on a Saturday morning, and they call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, in, in their translation called the New World Translation, uh, most of the times, well, all the time that the word Yahweh is rendered, or Lord, capital O, capital, uh, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, is uh, spelled Jehovah in the New World Translation. So when Isaiah 43.10 says, You are my witnesses, saith Jehovah, that is where they get their name. And so we'll also see later on how even the very verse where they get their name refutes their beliefs about who Jesus Christ is. Isaiah 44.6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. Isaiah 44, 24, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. So there is only one God, and he has created all things. The only thing that is eternal is God himself. You don't have God in the creation, you have God who created all things. Isaiah 45, 5 through 7, I am the Lord, there is none else, there is no God besides me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Verse 18, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited, I am the Lord and there is none else. You get the message here? I, Yahweh says, I am the Lord, I am the only God, there is none other. Verses 21 through 23, Tell ye and bring them near, Yea, let them take counsel together, who hath declared this from ancient time, who hath told it from that time, have not I, Yahweh, and there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. So God, being the only God who has created everything, has the right to have his creation worship only him. And he has sworn by himself that everyone will bow the knee to him. Every tongue shall swear allegiance to him. This will become very interesting when we look at verses in the New Testament and see how they are applied to Jesus Christ. Isaiah 46 verse 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Now, I can go on and on because there are many, many scriptures that teach monotheism and teach that God, the Lord, Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -He, Yahweh, the, the formal name of God, that God, the Hebrew God, the God of the Bible, is the only God that exists, that ever will exist. Now, coming off of monotheism, the next foundation of Christianity, of course, is the Trinity. And some of you who may, may not be familiar with this, you might be thinking, wait a minute, you just talked about monotheism. Why would a foundation of Christianity also be something called a Trinity if, if we only believe that there is one God? Well, Trinitarians, those who believe in the historical doctrine of the Trinity, are monotheists. But uh, they are Trinitarian monotheists. They believe uh, simply that God is one being and three persons. We believe, 
I am a Trinitarian. I wholeheartedly believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. In fact, I believe that the Bible oozes and bleeds the doctrine of the Trinity. The Trinity simply is that God is one being and three persons. Who are the three persons? Uh, namely, the Father, the Son, or the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Saying that God is one being and three persons is important because we must distinguish between the terms being and person. We acknowledge monotheism, God is one being. We acknowledge that he's three persons. So how does this work? We do not say that God is one being who is somehow three beings. We do not say that God is one person who is somehow three persons. He is one being, and this one being is shared by three persons. And these three persons are co-equal and co-eternal. Now, to distinguish and define the terms being from person, let me give you these examples. A rock has being, but the rock is not living, nor is it personal. A tree has being, a tree is also living, but it is not personal. Each of us is a human being. Each of us has a being, each of us is living, and each of us is personal. So we are different from a rock and a tree, but all, but. How we are similar to a rock and a tree is that each of us is one being. Each of our beings consists of one person. Now, there are some people who might uh, think that they have more than one person in their being, but those are usually what we would call schizophrenics, and usually you... Um, Put on, put, uh, put them in a big uh, suit with uh, uh, long sleeves and tie them and put them in uh, rooms so that they bounce off the walls and can't hurt themselves. But uh, each of our being consists of only one person. Our being is shared by only one person. You are one being and one person. I am in one being and one person. On the contrary. That is not the same with God. God is also one being. His being is not our being. Our, but his one being consists of three co-equal and co-eternal persons. I'm one being, one person. God is one being, three persons. And each person of God fulfills different roles in redemption and glorification. We will look at that later, how each of the three persons of what we call the Godhead uh, performs different roles in the whole uh, eternal plan of salvation and how God glorifies himself. The triune God brings glory to himself in how each of the three persons perform their distinct roles. Now, let me take note, of, let me make a, a quick note here. The scriptures force us to this conclusion of the Trinity. I mean, you know, let me give you this, uh, give you an illustration, you know, if, uh, remember when you were a kid, or maybe you are, you still are a kid, and you're listening to this, but, uh, you know, say your mom makes cookies, and these cookies are for a church function, and she puts the cookies in a cookie jar, and then uh, she says to you, now do not touch the cookies when I'm gone, um, these cookies are for the church function, so um, don't touch them. And, of course, knowing how yummy they are, they're like chocolate chip cookies, and that's your favorite. When your mom is not looking, you reach in the cookie jar and you take a cookie. And um, when your mom finds out, she, she kept careful count of all the cookies there, and then she finds that there's one or two or three or a dozen missing, she says, uh, now, Junior, did you take a cookie or two or three or ten and you say no I didn't you lie about it but she knows that you're not telling the truth and she says all right come clean and then you know that there's no way out of it and then you you say um the devil made me do it 
Now, of course, that's that's kind of a silly illustration. You know, of course, obviously, the, the devil didn't make you do that. But I'm saying that the scriptures force us to the conclusion of the Trinity. No one came up with the idea of the Trinity in his brain and then thought to himself, hey, let me come up with this idea that God is somehow one being and three persons. And it's it doesn't make sense to the rational mind. But I think that's a cool idea. Now, let me look at the scriptures scriptures and see if they teach this. No, no one came out with the idea of the Trinity. They came up with the idea of the Trinity. Well, we're going to look at church history later on. They came up with the idea of the Trinity by carefully studying the scriptures and understanding, well, that's what the scriptures force you to accept. Well, that is it for this first episode of the Truth Hub Podcast. Stay tuned for the next episode as we will look at henotheism, the idea that there is one God and lesser gods, and we'll also continue our study on the Trinity, identifying the three persons and what their roles are, who they are, and what they do. Stay tuned. Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning, and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso.